from them, not necessarily criminal kind of guns like assault rifles, but I'm talking about like hunting guns and other kind of things. They're almost as bad because that's the way that they grew up in some of these southern states and everything. The same with the LGBT community. There's definitely some people that are going to be very strong on those campaigns, but then we've got black churches that are the Democrats going to try to reach out to as well that still have a very old school kind of view about that lifestyle. So it seems like we're going to have to do a lot of in the Democratic Party of coalition building, even among people that might seem to have opposite ends of what their end game is. Right. I mean, and I will say the data is pretty clear. I mean, I don't know, I don't have that much data on the guns, but the data is pretty clear that African Americans, even in that situation that you've just described where they feel really religious and maybe they don't love that lifestyle, African Americans are not supportive of denying rights to other groups. Right. And so right. Um, they're not going to support, right? So they're not going to support, even if they say, oh, that's not my lifestyle, I don't support that, they're not going to move towards a candidate that's going to say, oh, under my life, right? Like Mike Pence, under his, you know, he, he, he supports programs that think that they can, um, you know, deprogram people around their homosexual lifestyle. Like that, that, like I just, you know, so I think even still, even if we do have some disagreements on some social issues, it's just at the end of the day, it's very hard to imagine. Um, a full swing of African American, even a block of African American voters supporting a Republican candidate at this time. I just can't see it. Um, and you know, that's not that's not my opinion. That's from research, right? So I have friends who, um, Ishmael White and Cheryl, their their book, Steadfast Democrats, it just came out. People should read it. Um, but one of the studies that they did, they literally ran an experiment where they tried to pay Black people to support Republicans, like in the experiment, and Black people still wouldn't do it. Wow. So right, right. So that's. That's, it just it feels unlikely, even in, even in saying, oh, I might not support this one issue that this party is pushing, it's just unlikely that, that we're going to see a full shift towards, towards the Republican Party. And other friends, too. My friend Tasha wrote um, conservative but not, not Republican, and she finds very similar things that, yes, we have these issues, but really it's our commitment to, um, to blackness that sort of keeps us within the Democratic Party. Yeah, and uh, I was just curious, uh, what are your views about how the Latinx community or just the Latin voting pop in general is going to come out? Because there was a time that they did seem to be, for lack of a better term, a lot of the more Cuban-oriented Latin population that still has some certain views about Cuba and the way that Cuba was created and things of that nature that were the popular kind of the Latin vote. And so they, they seem to gear more toward the right-wing kind of politics. But I'm thinking that more of the Latinx people are actually coming more closer to the view of like the African-American population, particularly the young African-American population, and that we're going to see more of a democratic swing for the Latinx community based on some of the things that they've seen happening with ICE raids and things of that nature. Is that what you're seeing in your research or am I correct yeah, in thinking sure. that there was a time well, I yeah, I mean, obviously Cubans in Florida have their own particular politics, but now I think Puerto Ricans outnumber Cubans in the state of Florida, so there already is a shift. But also, the last time I looked at this data, even young Cubans do not have that same affiliation with the Republican Party. So just even as more you know Cubans are getting you know sort of growing up and turning 18, that's not their choice. And so nationwide, um, that's you know to the extent that we accept the national exit polls, right? Overall, the Latinx population has been solidly, you know, a majority, whatever you want to define as necessary, right? I think upwards of 60% or more have moved to the Democratic camp, right? So that's 2008, 2012, 2016, that's what we saw, right? So, um, of course, Florida is its own unique place, and they do have a, you know, they do have a, the largest Cuban population, but it's not even the largest Latinx, like, national origin community in the state of Florida anymore, because after 2020, we'll know that it's, I think Puerto Ricans are going to outnumber them, so... Yeah. Um, that's sort of going to be a declining trend in my mind based on the data. Yeah. And uh, just coming back to some of the other articles that you've written and everything, you actually wrote a little bit about what, even though you're in Oklahoma now, but you've got ties to the triangle as well. So you actually wrote for our local paper, The Independent, about some of the things that had happened in Durham politics. And we know that Durham, because we've actually talked to some of the people from Durham on this podcast. We've had Jillian on, had Javier, had Charlie, had as activists like uh, uh, Serena Sabring and um, Carl Kenny, but you actually talk about some of what goes on with Durham with the way Durham is a unique town. It's kind of a pack controlled town with these prim primary packs that have been around forever, whether that's the Friends, whether that's uh, the People's Alliance and things of that nature, but then there's like a new blood that isn't quite going by that way, But and we've seen that with some of the campaigns that have been run where some of the old packs were not as strong as they used to be. At least that's the 
view that I got. I was just wondering if that's kind of what you saw as well, that some of the old packs don't have the kind of view, kind of cloud that they used to have, and they also are having to open their doors up a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think one thing, so I, you know, I wrote a book even before I lived in Durham about the role of endorsements in local elections. So when I moved to Durham, it was like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that this place exists where they do this. Um, and so I always like to tell people when I talk about Durham is, you know, one, I think the, the beauty of the pack is it takes a burden off the voter, right? And so in these low information elections, local elections in particular, um, you know, there's no party, right? It's, they're nonpartisan. Um, not everyone has time to attend upwards of 20 to 15 or 15 to 20 candidate forums, right? And so the endorsements from the organizations, which, you know, from the organization's perspective, they spend a lot of time, right? They spend a lot of time doing the research. They ask, they read these questionnaires, they interview them, they, they have a body that votes, right? And so in that sense, the, the, the organizations really feel like they're providing a service. And so I always tell people, listen, if you don't, if you don't want to use the PAC, you are under no obligation to. You can attend the forum. You can read all the questionnaires. The Indy puts them online. You can get them online from the PA, right? Like you, you have access to all the information, and you can make your own decision. But if you're kind of a busy person who wants to be a local voter but you don't have that kind of time, then guess what? You only need to know one thing. Where do I stand on this pack? And then you can vote with them, right? Like that's it, and that's, right. a, very, that's a good place, right? And that's not to me any different than I view myself as a Democrat, whoever we nominate in November, I'm supporting them. That's the same cue. That's the same heuristic. That's the same, I agree with the worldview that you're presenting me. I believe if I elect you, you'll work on these issues. It's the same thing, right? So I don't like when people speak so ill of, of these cues, right, which to me are just important pieces of information that people have an option to use. Of course, again, you don't have to use them at all. Um, I do think, though, that we're sort of watching in, in time, right? So one of the things that Alexis and I did in our paper um, from the 2015 data, try to just think about sort of who's been picking winners, which, end, which ended up being the title of the paper, right? And it is true that the People's Alliance has been very strong, right? Um, in, in, the, in the last, I don't know, 20 years, we might say, um, you know, yeah. that they've been really strong. But, of course, there were times when the committee was really strong, right? And so one of the things I learned through my research that maybe people sort of who've lived in Durham for a long time know is that, you know, the, the city council used to be much larger. Um, it used to be 13 people. And I believe that it was the friends and the committee that kind of worked together in a coalition to reduce the size of the council so that it could be more effective and that they could get better people to run, right? And so when you think about that, that's, that's a powerful position to say, I helped put forward something that, that, that shrank the size of a council so that it could be more effective, right? Um, and so I think that there was times when, when, when each organization, and I think we're sort of living through a, a strong PA time, but, you know, the last two local elections, the endorsement process hasn't been without controversy, right? And so we know that, that they, the meetings have gone long. Um, it's been very deliberative, right? So people spoke mm -hmm. and people advocated for their candidates, and then people left and, and they had a list, right? And then we've seen people come out and say, oh, I don't want to support that list. That's not what I want to do, right? And so I think that these are just, you know, in some ways it's good that we have that type of deliberative process. To me, it's like real democracy, right? Like you sat in the room with other people and you, you advocated for your candidate, but then we, we, we counted, and one person won. And so I think even this um, time, obviously I haven't lived in Durham in a couple of years, but the reports out of, like, the school board situation, right, where right. They, the, out of PA, you know, uh, Alexander was uh, endorsed. And then all these people are coming out with, like, oh, I want to still support this other person. And to me, I, to that I say, if you trust the PAC, that's fine, um, but you, you participate in the process. So now is not the time to say you don't, you don't like the PAC. Right, because in Durham, this is the one thing I learned early on first interview, there's two elections in the city of Durham when we run for local politics. It's the PAC election, it's the endorsement election, and then it's the real election. So to everyone who participated in the process, you've already told me that process is valuable because you participated in it. You did the steps. Yeah. You filled out your questionnaire. You went to the interview. You went to the thing. You stood up. At the, you had people come to the meeting. So then don't turn around and belittle that process. And does that mean you have to follow the PAC? Absolutely not. But to my mind, if you as a candidate engage with the process, you agree to respect the outcome. And there was no need for you to publicly, right? I'm not saying the candidate did this right, but to me, the people around the candidate, there's no need to then make all these public statements. Just when you vote, you don't have to listen to the endorsement, right? But otherwise, you're undermining the process, which, again, regardless if you love the PAC, the PAC believes that they're providing a piece of information to voters that makes it easy for them. That's not the case when people are undermining it, writing letters, I'm not voting for this person, I never supported them. 
but you went through the process, so you only support the process when it goes your way. That doesn't sound right. Right? So I think people need to be careful. Again, either way, and I'm not advocating everyone to listen to the past, but if you already went through the process, you already told me that it's valid, but now you don't like it because it wasn't the outcome you wanted, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, so, that doesn't sound right at all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think, you know, and to be fair, right, she won um, despite that pushback, and I'm so proud of her. Like, I'm here. I gave money to her campaign. I don't care if anyone knows because I thought it was the right time for her. And I saw that people were not trying to support her, even though every other year they support whatever the pack, right? Like it was just a hot mess. And I think that that just really undermines that process. And so then, you know, of course that's not from the organization. I should say the organization was very clear that they wanted to support her, that that was their top candidate. But I'm looking at all these people signing these letters and saying, what? like, mm, then don't, then just don't do the packs. And then I don't want to see you at the endorsement meeting in the future. Right, because you're, yeah, that, you're saying that when the process doesn't go your way, you don't like the process anymore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, the other person that really, and I don't know whether you followed the campaigns or not, but it was really interesting also watching both Joshua Gunn's run for office as well, and he might have some other runs planned and everything, but also watching Pierce run first for a local seat and then go to the statewide level, which he's in the loss and everything. When some people have you know, speculated that, you know, that he didn't have that kind of experience, that he's, his background is out of music, that he should have, like, earned his time, gone through the process, you know, started off, some people have said, it, as low as the school board, and not that the school board is low, but, go, you know, started at that kind of level or a county, city kind of level, and then worked his way up to the state level. And that kind of, like, comes to this attitude that I guess some people have about some of the young guard, which is that they need to go through the channels. And I was just wondering, as a scholar, what some of your views are when you hear that kind of conversation. I mean, I think that that kind of conversation is really, um, I mean, in some ways, even my opinion on it doesn't matter, if only for the reason that, you know, we've seen young people run and win, right? Because if you think about it, right, like people told Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, don't run. Like, oh, you can never win. But she took out an incumbent that was, that was his seventh re-election coming up, and he didn't even get to participate, right? When she primaried him out, she became the effective representative, right? So I'm not really here to say, like, oh, young people, you need to bide your time. Like, it's up to the voters. If the voters want change, the voters are going to vote for change. If the voters want whatever, your, whatever the experience, I'm putting that air quotes, you can't see me, if that's what they want, that's what they're going to support, right? So I loved, um, I loved Josh's campaign. Um, I thought about the numbers really hard, right? So, again, I already have a paper on the 2015 data. The numbers from 2015, it was a clear divide, right? The numbers from 2019, that divide is not that clear. He didn't lose by that many votes. And, of course, it only takes one to be the winner, right? So it's not like it was, like, you know, 99 to 100, but he didn't really lose by that many votes. And so even, you know, I know it was rainy that day. You know, I've told people a different day, a better weather day, a better turnout day, Josh would have been elected to that council, right? The campaign he ran was so grounded um, in the community. It was so, um, you know, it it was almost like just a love letter to black people in Durham. And I know that that's, I I don't know him. You know, I've only met him in passing. I never interviewed him for my project, but I mean, it was a beautiful campaign to watch. And at the same time, I understood people who, you know, wanted Javier to, to win, right? It is historic to elect the first Latinx woman to the council, right? It's, it's great that she served um, and provided that representation with the appointment, but, you know, to run and to win, I think it sends a strong signal. Um, but I think that that's what I meant earlier when I said it just comes down to turnout, right? Because a thousand yeah. more people showing up to vote for Josh, Josh is on the council, right? And it just didn't yep, go yep. his way, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a blowout. It was such a close race. And so, you know, I think that's the other thing, right? So I think we need young people, uh, to come and kind of buck the system, right? Because I think it's necessary and it can ha- help us get energized. But even more importantly, I think even as we think about what does diversity on the council or any board look like or any body, right? Sometimes that diversity is in the form of race and gender. We might think of, or even sexuality, we think of those things first, but the diversity of experience, right? Like Josh is not just a, a, a maker of music. He's not just a rapper, right? He, he, he works with the chamber. He knows business. He knows about economic development. And, again, given his campaign, it, to me, which, again, was like a love letter to black people in Durham, I, I'm, I'm, I wonder what he, you know, what was he cooking up to, like, help black, right? Like, we know that it's not the same black Durham that it was even 20 years ago, right? And so it's, I, I felt people's frustration that he didn't quite make that hurdle. And it's not that I don't like, and, you know, I mean, I, don't, I, I couldn't even vote this time because I haven't lived there in a long time. But, you know, so I think those things, right? So I think if we tell young people you can only run when you're old, 
that's not a good, I don't think that's a good signal. And I think to the voters, if you want to see change or you believe in fresh ideas, 